And this, by the way, is true of any finite domain, right? When you first enter into the finite domain, the act of exploring is really interesting and fulfilling. Then you've optimized, you've found out what the shape of the domain is and what kinds of things work and what don't work. So then the act of optimizing has a visceral response because that's where the, that's where the rewards come. But if you become that thing that's optimizing, then you're now locked into a circumstance where at some point you're going to go over the top of the curve and now you're getting diminishing returns. Um, and of course, the point is that if you become that thing, you've actually lost the ability to move out and jump into other kinds of games willy-nilly or play games that don't have those characteristics at all. So when we think about optimizing humans for sovereignty so that they could move between doing fighter pilot or making love or raising a baby or assessing a totally foreign environment or whatever, right? Um, there's obviously education that's involved. And you also started in terms of how to learn new skills, right? There's meta education, epistemology. How do I assess when I need a new skill? How do I go about learning new skills? Well, you know, there, there's all, all of that, but you also said one has to be able to deal with the emotions that arise in new environments. So there's emotional skills and personal skills. And then, you know, we also related the topic of medicine and healthcare to this and that we move from just a, a uh, sick care model to a sovereignty optimization where people's physiology and their state and their ability to address it is also part of that. So, and obviously with Neurohacker, we're starting to look at mind brain, right? The, there's a goal there. So what we talked earlier about how things like economics and like macro world things affect people's health through, uh, advertising dynamics that are sending the hypernormal stimuli of sugar all the time, right? Through marketing. Mm -hmm. But then there's this other side of do people's physical health, well-being affect macro dynamics? And if so, how and how is that part of the sovereignty optimization? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Tell me, ask that again. So <clears throat> you mean along the lines of does a population where everybody in the population is depressed show up, for example, in different politics? Yes. Okay. Uh, and different, by, cons different consumption patterns, crime patterns, whatever. Right. I mean, I, I, obviously, the way that I ask that question makes it pretty easy to answer. The answer is obviously yes. Um, and it's funny, like we can do it like all, all the way down. Uh, so let's say, for example, uh, you're somebody who has um, a particular addictive response to uh, anxiety where you eat food. Uh, because the, the visceral act of eating a food causes your body to have certain dumps of endorphins um, and serotonin levels go up. And so therefore you, your anxiety levels ambiently feel like they go down. And so you more or less feel like you're back into uh, being okay. Um, so then you're going to have the characteristic of overeating. Well, interestingly enough, if lots and lots of people have that characteristic, then you're going to have a, an economy that is going to begin to optimize for those kinds of choices which is bizarre, like you have both, you have a feedback loop. On the one hand, people who have an addiction to that particular approach to dealing with anxiety are actually generating a real economic signal of, I want more things that are subject to overeating. Um, and therefore those food artifacts that do actually satisfy that addiction well, like say potato chips. Um, and on the other side, you have a uh, manipulation media and advertising infrastructure that is incentivized to push people into domains that are likely to be triggered by that particular addictive response because that will maximize their ability to generate profits on the products they've already spent time investing in. Um, that's a really bad feedback loop. Um, and then you can imagine that, say, for example, you're somebody who's in the industry and you're present to the reality of this feedback loop, then you're going to have to be engaging in your own personal adaptive response, which some people call um, as if sociopathy, meaning that if you're present to the negative consequences of the choice that you are locally responsible for, you either have to choose to be delusional, which is to say to not take your own responsibility seriously and imagine something that it just isn't reality. Um, suicidal, meaning you have to actually make choices that you think are in fact good for the whole, but are definitely not good for you locally. Um, or a sociopath, meaning you have to be willing to accept the fact that consequences of your choices are good for you but not good for the whole. Um, any one of which is, in fact, a terrible thing. And, 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 and what's interesting is that no given individual agent acting on their own is likely going to be able to resolve that problem. Um, and the game dynamics are if you do the thing that's good for the whole and bad for you, you lose. And so, so, so then, over <clears> time, iteratively, there are few people, fewer and fewer people who choose that. 
and more and more people who choose either the as if sociopathy or the lie. That's right. Yeah. And so what ends up happening now, if you imagine that at a neurological level, you spend, let's say, 10 hours a day in a space where you're combining a variation on as if sociopathy and delusion, you're actually going to have congenital neurological changes. Um, which are going to show up in all the rest of the ways that you show up in life. So you're going to have a weird relationship with your spouse. You're going to have a weird relationship with your kids. And you're going to make weird choices in politics. And you're going to resp- I mean, it's just going to continue to go, um, which is not that different than saying, for example, if you had an entire population that was addicted to opium or an entire population that was uh, sort of functionally alcoholic, which, by the way, was, you know, the medieval, me- medieval Europe uh, could be characterized as an entire population who are functionally alcoholic. Um, and I think pre- uh, like mid 19th century giant parts of America had the same characteristics. So you know, we can run this at a neuro, at a physiological level. We can run it at a behavioral level. Uh, we can run it at the feedback loops between them. Um, but that's, you know, it's important to take into account the fact that that's the case. Uh, and then think about what kind of levers, again, we keep coming back to the same notion of when you see the whole, you see how all the pieces feed back on each other. Um, it is, in fact, just necessary just to be thoughtful on how they feed back on each other and how does one begin to engage in this subtle process, which I don't think, by the way, is actually sort of intrinsically harder than other things that we do well. It's just not something we've actually developed a lot of skillfulness in yet. Uh, I think that the practice of being able to be perceptive of how many, many various systems operate and being able to be skillful in shifting them in desired ways is actually just something that we need to build skill at. Um, I don't think it's something that is obviously beyond our capacities.